Good morning. Not sure if you'll be watching this during the morning or the evening or the afternoon, but today when I'm recording it, I'm pre-recording this for this coming Sunday, which is January 16th, MLK Sunday. And I'm going to uh, be away this weekend, spending some time out in the woods with my family. And so I'm pre-recording this on what is a chilly morning for us South Floridians, but beautiful because, of course, we look forward to having a little bit of reprieve from the heat. And um, it always reminds me when it's cold outside here in South Florida and Jupiter or Palm Beach Gardens or Juno Beach that... It's probably really cold in the rest of the country. I have a friend that lives in a suburb of Detroit, and I'm pretty in touch with her pretty often, and it's bitterly cold up there in Michigan. Um, so I want to remember uh, our friends and family who live up north when we have a nice day of surprisingly cool weather down here. They've got some serious weather to deal with. And... As I'm taking some time off, I've been in quarantine this in you know since last Sunday, and I didn't expect to uh, have a week like this. But this is what we we're in with this pandemic, and that's why I have uh, recorded sermons every week. Also, to let you know that my daughter, who tested positive last Saturday, uh, now this morning has tested negative finally, and her symptoms went away on Wednesday morning, so we're pretty confident that uh, she's going to be okay, and we've brought her out of isolation. So that was good. We had a, <laughs> a mom-daughter hug today. So, so she said, Mom, can I hug you now? And, and uh, when the timer went off and the test still showed that it was negative, we, we, had a, we had a beautiful hug. And so we're just grateful to be out of the COVID uh, situation right now and that grateful that Sean and I both tested negative each time we tested during this time. Thank you for your prayers and reaching out to my family. We are absolutely fine. Uh, things, are, things are really good for us, so we're very fortunate. This morning... Our chapter in the book that we make the road by walking, and we've discussed it in, in the Bible study class, and now we'll bring it forth uh, with a message. She, he's got quite a few passages of scripture here, and a lot of the gospel reading in the book, the book of Luke. So I'll start at the beginning, and maybe I'll skip through a little bit of it. So we're looking basically at Luke chapter four. And then chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. So it's almost the whole chapter of 4, and then 1 through 11. The first part of Luke chapter 4 is Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. This is where Jesus is preparing for his ministry. Uh, last week, we talked about his baptism and the dove descending and, and how uh, Jesus becomes this, uh, is blessed to, to begin his ministry and prepared by John the Baptist. The people are being prepared to hear his message by John the Baptist. And then Jesus comes on the scene after this time in the wilderness. So here he is alone in the wilderness and fasting. The, He's on what native tribes in uh, South and, and North America would often translate into what we would call a vision quest. He's gone out into the wilderness to capture a vision and to take some time to be a part to begin his ministry in the right way. And I can't say enough about how important it is to take time away. Jesus did it a lot in the in the Gospels, so... You know, the evidence, the proof is in the pudding. It's right here. <laughs> and to take time away to renew and, and have a, a spiritual focus on that time away. So, for example, in the United Methodist Church in the Florida Conference, we have the five-day spiritual academy, which is kind of hard to get into because it's very um, a sought-after retreat event. So I would recommend that. So look into it on the conference website. Also, if any of you have been on the Walk to Emmaus, which is also a United Methodist event, it's it's ecumenical. We invite all people from all faiths to come and enjoy a weekend with Jesus through the Walk to Emmaus. But the materials that 
are used for that are come out of our uh, upper room where the General Board of Discipleship is in Nashville. So that's that's something we do to help leaders have a, a spiritual awakening on a weekend. It is there's such a precedent for it in the in the church, and I'm glad that our denomination supports that spending time away on spiritual retreat. So I want to encourage you. Uh, to do something like that. If you're a people person, do do a retreat like the walk to Emmaus. But if you if you really relish your time alone, if you uh, get your energy from being alone and reading and also praying and spending time in silence and solitude, I would encourage you to do a silent uh, retreat as well. There are so many retreat centers uh, around the, the state, especially because we have this great... Uh, state with uh, recreational opportunities and the catholic church especially has put many different uh, retreat centers around especially any even our area i would encourage you to take make use of them because jesus sets an example for us here in in luke all all, luke and mark and matthew all three of them have this temptation And, and um but luke's is a little different and he's a little more expanded in the explanation. Mark's is completely short. Jesus was in the wilderness where he was tempted, and then he started his ministry. Matthew's is very similar to this one, except there's a few more things that are said, it, just like just like it was with John the Baptist. Uh, there's a few more things that are included here in the Gospel of Luke. So let's look at Luke chapter 4, um, verses 1 through 30. Buckle in, here we go. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan He was baptized and led by the spirit in the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days. And when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up to, up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority. For it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. I'm going to stop there and talk a little bit about the temptation in the wilderness. So we have Jesus here in the wilderness with these three separate vignettes of temptation. The first one in which we identify that Jesus is very hungry and that he could immediately stave off that hunger, break that fast by making uh, turning a stone into bread. But the temptation isn't so much to feed his hungry human body as it is to show that he is able to feed the world by turning a stone into bread. And the temptation there is to be the miracle worker that saves people from physical hunger. We know that because of the way Jesus responds. One does not live by bread alone. The temptation there to be this guy who creates food and, and no one has to do anything but receive it is what the devil is tempting Jesus with. Jesus is saying, there's so much more to life than the body and then the needs of the body. 
because there is also the Spirit. And what Jesus has come to do in his ministry has more to do with the spiritual nature of the world than with the physical nature of the world. Yes, he will be against the empire that is oppressing the people. Yes, he will eventually be killed by that empire and show a sign of resistance when he is resurrected. But there's so much more than that. Not that bread isn't important. One cannot live by bread alone doesn't mean bread's no good. It means that bread's important and I will be the bread of the world. This is said later. However, bread isn't the only thing. And our corporal bodies and the things that we think are important in the material world are not the only thing. And that's what this temptation means when Jesus says one cannot live by bread alone. Then he's lifted up and shown all the kingdoms of the world. Interestingly enough, every type of kingdom, or we sometimes call it empire, is owned by the devil. And we kind of knew that, didn't we? But <laughs> uh, So he says, I, I have all this authority. I can give it to you if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus, I don't think it's even a, a, a temptation for him. No, thank you. I know who I worship. I know what my meaning is. I mean, he's just had this experience at the Jordan where God has said, I am so pleased with you. He's on the right track. The devil, you can have those kingdoms and eat it too. <laughs> so there he goes. The third thing he does is he takes him into Jerusalem onto the Temple Mount, the highest place, and says, just throw yourself off the temple. Be an amazing miracle worker. Show everybody that you cannot be killed, that, that the angels will bear you up. Now, what he does is he quotes Psalm 91. Let me make sure I'm doing this right. He quotes Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12, back to Jesus, the devil does, in this passage. And what he is doing is he's quoting that little psalm, that one little psalm where it says, God will command, command the angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot on the stone. That passage, those two verses, is everything that we theologically get from the scripture to develop the whole notion of a guardian angel. That's, there's never says the word guardian angel in the Bible at all. It may say it in your Bible translation as a title above that psalm, maybe, but that's not in the biblical literature that is the original, you know, with the Hebrew and the, the Greek text. This is the passage that we get the whole idea of that from. And it's really more, um, um, if you grew up in, in the Roman Catholic Church, you would have a little prayer about the guardian angel, but that's where this comes from. So uh, the devil is tempting him with this guardian angel idea. And Jesus is not tempted by this either because he says, and this is a passage we used a lot, especially during this COVID virus, uh, don't test the Lord your God. You know, people say, well, if you believe God will keep you safe, you don't need a vaccine or a mask. And I said, well, you know, there's this thing in here that says don't test God because I don't drive with my blindfold on either. I just, I take it off when I get up in the morning and I don't, I don't do that. But so, cause we're not supposed to put God to the test. We're, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to kind of like say, okay, God, how do you want me to work in the world? And that's where the relationship goes. Not, I'm going to do this God and you're going to protect me. It's really more of a, oh, let me ask God first, you know, rather than forgiveness permission is is important so here we are in this relationship with god and jesus could be tempted to get it all done and over with everyone sees him saved from the temple mount save himself and here he is the miracle the wonderful guy now that really contradicts what we see in mark every time he does a miracle he tells people don't let anybody know that I've done this amazing thing because he wants to be secretive because he's not here to be amazing. He's not here to be some David Copperfield, which is, I'm talking about the musician, not the novel from the Charles Dickens, but he's not here to be some amazing illusionist that encourages all of us to follow him because he's amazing. He's not here to be the Jeff Bezos of his day. He's here to change hearts and transform the soul. And so these amazing things that would attract people to Jesus and make them believe in those miracles, 
the miracle is really something that happens in the heart as in transformation of a person who was once like this and is now like this. So the wedding at Cana is the first sign, we call it a sign, in John's gospel of Jesus' amazing ministry. It's how he begins his ministry. Ultimately, though, when he turns the water into the best wine they've ever had, his goal in that entire thing was, one, to please his mother who requested such a thing, even though he said to her, ah, my time has not come yet, I can't do this miracle. And then she was like persistent, like a mother would be. I'm one, so I know. He does this miracle to preserve the dignity of the host and nothing more. Not to show how amazing he is or how special he is or so that everybody would follow him because of this amazing thing. He wants people to follow follow him for a different reason. Segue, we're back in the scripture. Follow me, he says to the disciples. So here we have this rejection at Nazareth. This thing where he gets up and he he reads the scroll in the synagogue in the town that he grew up in, where where everyone knows him. His family lives there. He's from there. He's in this temple. He unrolls the scroll. He reads this passage from Isaiah, which says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, he stops there. He doesn't read, and the vengeance of the Lord part that's in the scripture, but he doesn't read the rest of the, of the proclamation from Isaiah 61. He just reads this little bit, the year of the Lord's favor. Everyone, when he sat down and, min- and, and preached to them, he said, today, this day, not yesterday, not today, not maybe, not perhaps, some, Today, this has been fulfilled, fulfilled, all of it, in your hearing. What? This, this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's going to set the captive free and recovery of sight to the blind. The year of the Lord's favor. And they were like, whoa, how can he say that? Who is he? And they spoke well of him. And they were kind of asking, is this Joseph's son? You know, we know this guy. Or how could he be doing all these things? And so he says, well, (laughs) yeah, it's me, Jesus, Joseph's son. However, doubtless you will say to me, and this is in three um, uh, verses, uh, chapter three, verse 23. He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb. Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things we have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them except the widow at Zarephath and Sidon. And then... There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. And when they heard this, they got up and drove him out of the town, led him to the brow of a cliff on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through their midst of them and went on his way. So the problem is when he says this about the hometown requesting or asking or demanding of him miracles for them. He's saying, look what God did. In the time of Elijah, God saved the Gentile widow, the widow of Zarephath and Sidon. In the time of Elisha, there were many lepers, but none was cleansed, but the Gentile general, Naaman the Syrian. So he's saying to them, yeah, hey, we're here in the synagogue and you know who you are and you have this identity and God's love is bigger than that. When this proclamation was made by Isaiah and when Jesus repeated it, it didn't mean just for them. It meant for everyone. And so it is a total situation. It is a covering the globe. It is an inclusive situation commentary 
on this passage from Isaiah that Jesus has for them. And it makes them mad and it makes them want to hurl him off a cliff. Because the ministry that Jesus is about is bigger, much bigger than their narrow minds can, can grasp in Nazareth. So in chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, Jesus calls his first disciples. And there's, a, there's an importance about this, that he had this rejection at Nazareth because this is part of the cost of being a disciple. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and they were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deeper water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. In Mark's gospel, they do it kind of fast. There's no context for it, like this miraculous catch of fish. However, you have to remember that when Jesus was in the boat, he was teaching the crowds. So they sat there and listened to what he had to say. Thus, the reason why Simon Peter would call him master at that point, knowing that he was this learned rabbi, the words of Jesus had already started to work on Peter's heart. The miraculous catch of fish probably put them in good financial standing to leave everything behind and follow Jesus. Follow Jesus into the world so that they could be fishers of humankind and not fish anymore. They were catching people, and they were catching people like they had been caught and embraced by Jesus' message. The word disciple shows up more than 250 times in the New Testament. The word Christian shows up three times. That should tell us something. We talk a lot about how it is to be a Christian and what you need to be a Christian. And I'm a Christian. Are you a Christian? But are you a disciple? The New Testament tells us it's, it's more important than your identity as I'm this and you're not. Being a disciple means focusing on your relationship with Jesus and following him. You have a story of a miraculous catch in your life. I know you do. I have many. And you can identify with Simon Peter. Having listened to a message that compels you, that converts your heart, that invites you into a new relationship, you become a disciple there. And discipleship is a process. It's a lifelong journey into this whole realm of God, into the fullness of humanity, into what it truly means to be alive. And being alive and aliveness, is something we embrace in the book, is something that is so crucially important to Jesus, that our human nature be converted and conformed and transformed to the spiritual nature of the world. One did not say yes to discipleship lightly. They tried to hurl him off a cliff for what he had said. They are going to see many 
snares and toils, as the song says, in their life of being Jesus' disciples. But it's important. In, in, the, in the chapter on uh, this topic, when our author has all these passages from Luke, he has a paragraph that reads like this, Jesus managed to avoid execution that day, not being hurled off a cliff, but he knew it wouldn't be his last brush with hostile oppression. Soon he began inviting select individuals to become his followers. As with aspiring musicians who were invited to become student of the master musician, this was a momentous decision for them. To become disciples of a rabbi meant entering into a rigorous program of transformation, learning a new way of life, a new set of values, a new set of skills. It meant leaving behind the comforts of home and facing a new set of dangers on the road. Once they were thoroughly apprenticed as disciples, they would be sent out as apostles to spread the rabbi's controversial and challenging message everywhere. One did not say yes to discipleship lightly. When he said, follow me, and they dropped everything and followed him, there was a preparation before that. Go back to John the Baptist and the things that he taught about this new world order, this vision for Jesus' ministry. Go back to the idea that one does not live by bread alone, that, that, is, that significantly important is character formation and self-control. And spiritual disciplines like fasting and prayer and Christian conferencing. It's a long, hard process. And it doesn't come miraculously through a zap of a lightning bolt. It doesn't happen overnight. It's, it's not something that Jesus can do for you as a miracle and put bread on your table when there was once stones. It's a process. It's an invitation to a relationship. And so this gospel of Luke with his extra things that he puts in is really good for us because they all relate one to the other. Jesus' preparation in the wilderness, his rejection at Nazareth, and then his calling of the disciples. And Jesus calls you and me today to enter into that relationship. I hope as you begin this year with everything that's going on in our world and in your lives particularly, I hope that you'll begin this year with a sense that Jesus is inviting you to a deeper relationship, to discipleship to Bible study and prayer and Christian conferencing. If you have any questions or need any assistance with that, please contact me. My email address is on the website. Email's best. You can call the church during the week. But I invite you to go deeper into this relationship with Jesus. Maybe take a Bible study class. We have three weekly classes that are offered at the church, one on Sunday mornings and, and two on Wednesday, uh, Tuesdays. Tuesday morning, Tuesday night, uh, and they are about this book, uh, We Make the Road by Walking by Brian McLaren. But I would encourage you, as you begin this year, to be a disciple. It's important that you're a Christian, of course, but it's more important that you're a disciple, that you enter into discipleship and that you are a learner and being led by that first century rabbi whom we worship and adore. Amen.